قلبهم سيغلبون في بضع سنين لله الأمر من قبل ومن بعد ويومئذ يفرح المؤمنون بنصر الله ينصر من يشاء وهو العزيز الرحيم وعد الله لا يقلف الله وعده ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا وهم عن الآخرة هم غافلون أولم يتفكروا في أنفسهم ما خلق الله السماوات والأرض وما بينهما إلا بالحق وأجل مسمى وإن كثيرا من الناس بلقاء ربهم لكافرون صدق الله العظيم إن شاء الله يتغلب بنا إذا آمين ما شاء الله جزاكم الله خير Next إن شاء الله one of the founding fathers of this masjid Abdul Sabur Chaudhry who is also a poet Today, inshallah, we're going to have his son, uh, Shamsu Duha, read a poem which was written by his father. And then, inshallah, we'll hand the program over to Shaykh Imran. Duha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Allah is one. He was born to none. He exposed his own the way we are not known. Allah gave birth to none. Christ is not his son, beginning or end, he has none, he is the only the unlimited one. Quran is the guide, very simple and very wide. Allah challenged upon mankind to compose a single verse of its kind. Allah himself is protector, nobody is able even to alter, none was found so ever. Quran remains a miracle forever. Allah, thank you. Next, inshallah, for those of you who don't know, this is Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain uh, from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. He's one of the pioneers, pioneers of our age anyway, of Islamic, Islamic eschatology. Um, he's been worldwide, delivered a number of worldwide lectures, a number of which can be found on the internet and YouTube in particular. So inshallah, today's subject will be uh, the Muslim Alliance with Eastern Orthodox Christianity and the Mulhama. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Inshallah Sheikh Imam Hussain. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhina astafa khususana ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu <laughs> We greet you from this masjid in Birmingham in, the Brit in Britain with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Uh, respected Imam uh, Maulana Abdul Haq, brothers and sisters. Uh, our topic for today is the alliance with Rome. And uh, I want to, first of all, uh, pray for Allah's mercy and forgiveness on the soul of our brother Abdul Samur Chowdhury who came to this country long years ago and found no masjid 
and establish this masjid here. And tonight it is my honor to come to speak in the masjid established by this noble soul, Abdus Sabur Chaudhry, and to have the company of his sons who are walking in his footsteps. May Allah have mercy on his soul, and may Allah forgive him his sins, and may Allah bless him with Jannah. I want to begin this lecture by sending a message to the modern West, to modern Western civilization. And the message doesn't come from me, it comes from the Book of Allah. I do not know what are the views of other scholars of Islam because I don't have the time to view videos. I don't have the time to read books. So I do not know how many other scholars there are out there who are of the same view that I am in extracting from the Quran that which we extract today. In consequence of which we say to modern Western civilization that your time in history is coming to an end. And we are grateful to Allah for that. Your 500 years of oppression, your 500 years of godlessness, your 500 years of decadence, your 500 years of ruling the world is coming to an end. And that's the message from the Quran. That the war which is now coming, in which the West is preparing to attack Russia, not the other way around. Russia has never attacked the West. The West has constantly been waging war on Russia for hundreds of years now. But the war which is now coming with Russia is the last war you'll ever fight. Because at the end of this war, you will not remain in the world as anything of any significance. The message that we have for modern Western civilization from this message here in Birmingham is that there is someone named Allah. And if you forget him, you pay a price for that. And he does not sleep. He watches everything. And he has conveyed a message in the Quran that we interpret to the effect that the war which is now coming, which is going to be a unique war in human history. There's never been a war like the one which is coming. And there'll never ever be another war like the one which is coming. That in this unique event in all of human history, Allah is not going to stand by as a spectator, but that he is going to intervene in this war. And the first step of our effort to explain to you his intervention in this war from the Quran, not the Hadith, from the Quran, comes from Surah to Rum of the Quran. Who is Rome? Our subject is uh, alliance with Rome. And we use the word alliance because in Surah Al-Anfal of the Quran, when we have quoted this ayah of the Quran many, many, many times already, and you'll have to kindly excuse me if I quote it one more time. If there are those who say, well, he keeps on repeating himself, I say to them, you don't need to waste your time listening to me if I'm repeating and repeating. There are many other scholars who listen to that, but there are others who have not heard me before. In Surah Al-Anfal of the Quran, Allah speaks, and he chooses the most appropriate Surah of the Quran, Anfal, to say, بَعْدَهُذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ الْكَافِرُونَ بَعْدُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْدُهُمْ 
but the kuffar are friends and allies of each other. Illam <coughs> tafa'alu If you do not do the same, if you, the Ummah of Muhammad wasalam, if you, the people who follow the deen of Allah, Islam, and you know we are not the only Muslims, you know that we are not the only people in Islam. Of course you know that. When Nabi Isa Islam comes back, what religion is he going to follow? It's Islam. And what religion did he follow the first time when he came? Who is Islam? And what is the religion of Musa Islam? It was Islam. And what is the religion of Ibrahim Islam? It was Islam. Because there's only one deen with Allah, Islam. So Al Kafiruna Ba'duhum Awliya the Kufar. They are friends and allies of each other. If Illam Tafa'alu, if you do not do the same, you who are in Islam and the followers of Muhammad are not the only ones in Islam. If you do not build alliance, friendship and alliance among yourselves, Takun fitnatun fil abdi wa fasadun kabir. There will be fitna on earth. That which will cause great distress for mankind. And there will be great corruption and destruction on earth. If you do not do the same, you who are in the religion of Islam. And only a schoolboy will say that the only ones who are in Islam are the followers of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And we are not schoolboys then. So then, we need to follow Allah's order in the Quran. And if we don't, the fitna and the fasad will continue. And it will grow greater and greater. Fasad kabir. So who should make friendship and alliance with each other? Against that alliance of the kuffar. When we who follow Nabi Muhammad wasalam, look around the world to see where are they amongst mankind those who are following Musa alayhi salam following Isa alayhi salam following Ibrahim alayhi salam even though some of their beliefs might be corrupted yet they have their hearts in the right place they're making a sincere effort to follow the deen which has come. They live lives of purity. They're not a wicked people. They don't enact legislation for their countries that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. No. And they're not oppressors. Rather, they are oppressed. Where are they? With whom we should make friendship and alliance? Does the Quran answer that question? Yes, it does. It says, for example, in Surah Al Ma'idah, and I'm repeating this, quoting this ayah of the Quran maybe 25,000 times already. So kindly forgive me if I have to quote it one more time. لَتَجِدَنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الْيَهُودِ You'll most certainly find at the time when the Qur'an was revealed and in time to come that those who have the greatest hatred for you would be Jews. وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا And those who are in shirk. This happened, this came to pass at the time when the Qur'an was revealed. And this is now taking place once again in the historical process. For the Jews who created the state of Israel, not all Jews, have now become the most hostile of all people to us, <coughs> waiting war on us. And so too that civilization built on shirk and kufr 
which is allied with the state of Israel. But the verse goes on to say, وَلَا تَجِدَنَّ أَقَرَبَهُمْ مَوَجَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الْيَهُودِ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ النَّصَارَ And you'll most certainly find at the time when the Qur'an was revealed and in time to come, that those who will be closest in love and affection for you, the Ummah of Muhammad would be a people who proclaimed, we are Christians. And then the verse goes on to give us the characteristics of this Christian people. Number one, that they have the institution of the priesthood. The priest is held in esteem and honor and respect. And they have the institution of monasticism. The monasteries are still there. The most monastic way of life is still preserved. They're not an arrogant people. They don't want to rule the world. Where are those Christians? All of us can search and easily find those Christians, except those who are taking weapons and money, USD, from Santa Claus to wage their bogus jihad. Yes, those are the only ones who can't see them. We can see that the orthodox Christian world has said this business about a man marrying another man and getting a marriage certificate it came out of a garbage bin and we throw it back into the garbage bin that's the orthodox Christian world does that orthodox Christian world still have the institution of priesthood do they hold their priest in esteem and respect yes they do do they still have the institution of monasticism, the monasteries, the monastic way of life? Yes, they do. Over here on this side of the world, the monastery is now McDonald's hamburgers and pizza, bingo all. But they still have the monastic way of life. So it looks as though Allah is speaking about them. And they are not an arrogant people. They don't want to rule the world. These here want to rule the world by the hook or by the crook and because Russia does not want to submit to them and China does not want to submit to them now they are preparing to wage war on Russia and China they have this this mysterious obsession this virus running through their veins that we are the chosen of the Lord God and we must rule the world that's arrogance. And arrogance came from Iblis. It didn't come from Allah. And it didn't come from Ibrahim Islam. So if these are the people who will be closest in love and affection for us, and they say we are Christians, they're not secularized. The primary identity is their faith. With whom should we make alliance? The answer, you should make an alliance with those who are closest in love and affection for you. That's, un that's the answer. The orthodox Christian world, therefore, is our natural ally as we attempt to bring an end to 500 years of oppression and bloodshed and arrogance in the world that came from modern Western civilization. What does the Quran say further on the subject of Rome? For that orthodox Christian world is referred to in the Quran as Rome. Okay, let's give you the proof. There's a whole surah of the Quran entitled Surah to Rome. And in this surah, Allah speaks and he says, بَعْدَهُوذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أَلِفْ لَا مِينَ And in my book entitled Methodology for the Study of the Quran, I have spoken on the letters of the alphabet, the Muqattaq. Hmm? Rome, Rome has been defeated. في أَدْنَ up In a land close by, close by to close by to this land where the Quran has been revealed. That's good. So you could be talking about Chicago or Alaska. 
No. Close by meaning close to this land in which the Quran was revealed. So if you want to look for room, you don't look for room in Bombay. You look for room in a land close by where Rome was defeated. That should not be difficult. But then Allah comes forward. Allah declares, rather the Quran comes forward to declare, prophetically so, meaning telling you what is going to happen in the future. If it doesn't happen, then the Quran is false. The Quran says, وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ and the kuffar of Mecca are listening because they are supporting the other side which defeated Rome and they were very happy that Rome was defeated because they identified Rome as our natural allies because Rome had a book which came from the one God and we have a book and both books talk about Moses and about Abraham so the kuffar of Mecca recognized that we were allies of each other, we were cousins of each other, Rome and us. So Allah sends down a message to tell the kuffar of Mecca, the mushrikun, وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِهُونَ That after this defeat, they will soon turn the tide and they will be victorious. So it better happen, otherwise the Quran will be false. Did it happen? Oh yes. While you were taking your weapons and your money from CIA to wage your bogus jihad, it did happen. And Rome was victorious. Fibidi Aisinin, in just a few years' time it happened. In just a few years' time this did happen after the revelation of the Quran. And then Allah went on to say something more about Rome and about Rome being victorious. Lillahi al-amr min qawm wa min ba'd. Rome has two victories ordained by Allah. Allah's command that Rome will have Two victories, not one. Lillahi al-amr min qabl wa min ba'd. The first victory just took place. And there's a second victory to come. Lillahi al-amr min qabl wa min ba'd. And on that day when Rome is victorious, وَيَوْمَ إِذِ الْيَخْرَبُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ the believers who follow this Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu islam, we will celebrate the victory of a Christian people. But those who have it, nothing in their hearts for Christians except bigoted hatred. Bigoted hatred. The only good Christian is a dead Christian. Give me a chance I won't go, on, go to Syria and kill them all. You have only a passing acquaintance with the Book of Allah. And on that day, when Allah takes the veils from off your eyes, and you're able to see the truth, you're going to, you're going to blame your scholars in Saudi Arabia who can misguided you. But it'll be too late at that time. Listen to the Quran and see whether the Quran is being explained accurately. And if it is, then turn and submit to the Qur'an before it's too late. This is my message to the Muslims of Britain. Lillahi al-amr min qablu wa min ba. Allah's command results in victory for Rome. On the first occasion, the one that came before, and the last one that is to come. Wa yawma idhin yafrahu al-mu'minun. And on that day, the believers will celebrate for that victory and when this takes place, they will celebrate this victory as well. Be Nasrillah. Celebrate Allah's help which came to a Christian people. 
yansuru me yasha. Allah helps whomsoever Allah wishes. In Allah Azizun Rahim. He is Aziz, or He is powerful. And with His power, He caused that to happen. And with His power, He caused this one also to happen. And He is Rahim. He is merciful for the oppressed, who long suffered oppression. This is our beginning of our lecture. Wa'ad Allah, this is Allah's promise to you. And Allah does not betray His promise. And so, the conclusion which we arrive at is that there is a natural affinity between the Muslims who will celebrate the victory of Rome and the Christian people who constitute Rome. So who is Rome in the Quran? It cannot be this Christian people here. No. It has to be that Christian people there. Nor can it be the Jews who are allied with these Christian people in a Zionist Judeo Christian alliance. No, it cannot be. Anyone who believes that this is Rome should buy a one way ticket to the moon. That is Rome over there. Now, when you go to the Hadith, if you find a Rome in the Hadith which is in conflict with the Rome in the Quran, what do you do? that uh, we make an alliance with Rome and we are victorious and then one from Rome stands up and says the cross is victorious and then a Muslim comes up and says no Allah is victorious and kills him I wish I could meet that Muslim man eh? what a shameful thing is done to kill a man but uh, where did he come from Bollywood or Bangladesh or Pakistan or in Indonesia, where he came from? Then he should say, Allah is victorious, you're going to kill the man. Maybe he came from the United States of America. And then when he kills the Christian, the two armies then lock to each other in big battle fighting. Is that a people who are closest in love and affection for you? Will they behave like that? No. The room in this hadith is in conflict with the room in the Quran. When you find a conflict between the hadith and the Quran, then either this hadith is fabricated, or part of the hadith is fabricated because it's in conflict with the Quran. Or, oh, the other possibility is that when the Quran speaks of Rome, it's speaking of one Rome. And when the hadith speaks here today of Rome, it's speaking about another Rome. Can that be possible? After the revelation of the Quran, Rome split into two. <laughs> One part of Rome remained in Constantinople and today they are Orthodox Christianity. But another part of Rome went to Italy, to the city of Rome and constituted subsequently Western Christianity. So this is the possibility that the Hadith is speaking about this Rome. And the Quran is speaking about that room. In which case there will be no conflict between the Hadith and the Quran. That some Muslims made a foolish mistake of making alliance with that room. And in the end, look at the, at the mess with which they ended up. That's an explanation of this apparent conflict between the Quran and the Hadith. We now turn to 
what are the consequences of alliance with Rome? When Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes back, he will come back to an ummah which will follow him because he was not sent to the ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. No. He was sent to Banu Israel. Is that true? Shake your head, yeah. The Quran says he was sent to Banu Israel. Ya Bani Israel, inni Rasulullahi ilaykum. So when he comes back, to who is he coming? If he's going to come to another people, of course now they're no longer known as Banu Israel, now they're known as Ahlul Kitab. But the two terms are synonymous. If Nabi Isa al-Islam is to return to another people, not just to Ahlul Kitab, then who must tell us that? Not Hadith, no Quran must tell us that. Because the Quran told us that he was sent to Banu Israel. So the Quran must tell us if there is naskh, cancellation or abrogation. It must come from the Quran. But there is no naskh, no evidence of naskh in the Quran. The, con the consequence therefore is that we have to accept that the same way he came the first time, he will come back the next time. He's going to come back to his ummah, not to us. <coughs> and so there will be an ummah who will follow Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus alayhi salam, when he returns. And it would not be the Ummah of Muhammad wasalam. Why? Who do we follow? We follow this Nabi. <laughs> this is our Nabi, Muhammad wasalam. This is not our Nabi. This is our Nabi. So he will have an Ummah who will follow him. And we will have the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam will be led by Imam al-Mahdi. Alama Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, Sir Muhammad Iqbal, didn't understand the subject. And that's why he said, regretfully so, that all the ahadiths on Imam al-Mahdi are all fabricated. And so there are two Ummahs at the end of history. How long will they last? How long will the Ummah of Nabi Isa alayhi salam last? Will it last until the end of the world? Or will there be a merger of the two? Who should answer that question? Answer from the Quran. If you give an answer from the Quran, that's it. Nobody can dispute with you. Because this is absolute truth in the Quran. So let's go to the Quran to find an answer to the question. Here is Nabi Isa al-Islam who returns. And he has his ummah who is following him, not us. So there is this Ummah and there is our Ummah. How long will this last? That's the question. So let's go to the Quran for the answer. And it's there in Surah to Ali Imran. It's called Allahu Ya Isa. And Allah says, O oh Jesus, 
in Nima Tawafiq, I'm going to take your soul. And of course, you know, when Allah takes the soul, there are only two possibilities. Huh? Only two, not three. Either he keeps the soul, in which case you're dead, or he returns the soul. Surah al Zumar, huh? in which case you didn't die. But when he took the soul of Nabi Isa, he didn't keep it. Because he said they didn't kill him, they didn't crucify him. So there's only one other possibility, <coughs> not two, <coughs> only one. When he took the soul, he returned it. That's it. And when he returned it, he returned it when they couldn't see, they didn't know, and then Allah raised him. وَمُطَحِّرُكَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And I'm going to cleanse you and purify you. Cleansing and purifying is always cleansing and purifying of mud and rubbish that they throw on you. The lies that they talk about you. The rejection of you as the Messiah. What they said about your mother. And then these people join with them in alliance. So they part, become part of the rubbish being thrown on you. I'm going to cleanse you of that. And that should bring joy and heart to the, to the Muslims. How will Allah cleanse him? What will Allah do to cleanse him of that rubbish? Listen to what he do. وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا This is how you're going to cleanse. I'm going to raise these who follow you. These who follow you, your ummah. I'm going to raise them high and above and dominant over these who throw rubbish at you and who commit kufr by declaring a man could marry another man and get a marriage certificate. But that's not the end of the ayah. When I raise these dominant over them, it will continue ila yawmil qiyamah. We have scholars present here in this gathering. So when the Quran declares that the Ummah of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, which follows him, will be raised high and above and dominant, dominant over that part which commits kufr, and this will continue until the end of the world. The implication is as plain as daylight that they will continue to follow him until the end of the world. And so this, this Ummah will continue in existence until the end of the world. There is the answer. The history will end with two Ummahs, not one. Sometimes it's difficult eh, to swallow the Quran. When the Quran is telling us that Allah is going to intervene and Allah is going to raise a Christian people who follow him above and dominant over those who commit kufr then why should there be some difficulty in your heart to turn to those Christian people with friendship and alliance and brotherhood and love when Allah is on their side. What's wrong with your heart? What's wrong with your capacity to think? When Allah says, I am going to do it, I am on their side. But you wouldn't be on their side because of your mantra, Asad this and Asad that, and Putin this and Putin that. Wait. Until that day, when the, the veils are taken off your eyes and the brainwashing has ended and you realize that you've been misled by the shuyukh 
who didn't have knowledge of the Quran and could not read the word correctly. We have in this gathering here one who experienced all of that for 20 years. And he's right here now in Birmingham, and he's right here in this masjid tonight. So he can tell you about it. This then is room with whom we should make the alliance. If this alliance is to take place, and at this time we see the forces all ranged against us, with Putin this and Putin that and Assad this and Assad that, how will the alliance come into being? Look at the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad <laughs> who tells us how the alliance will come into being, whether they like it or whether they don't. He said that Umran Ubayt al Maqdis, the hadith of Sunan of Bay Haki, narrated by Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when Jerusalem is sent to stage, and we see Jerusalem sent, moving to center stage when Trump recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Umran Ubayt al Maqdis, Karabu Yatrib. At that time, Yatrib now known as Medina, has it, is in forlorn desolation. That is the time when the Great War will take place. That is where we are now. The Great War will take place. The Malhama or Armageddon. Is there life on earth after that? Nuclear war? Yes, there will be. <laughs> because Surah Al-Rahman tells us that not all the missiles will be able to fly on that day. Surah Al-Rahman tells us <coughs> some of the missiles won't fly and others <laughs> will not fly in the direction they're supposed to fly. Because Allah sent angels at the battle, in the battle of battle. And Allah can send thousands of angels in this war which is coming. And so not all missiles will fly on that day. And not all of them will fly the direction they're supposed to fly. So this is not going to be the end of the world. If you read Surah Al-Rahman, you know this is not the end of the world. No. So after the Malhama, there is still life on earth. And the Prophet said, خروج الملحمة فتح القنستانتينية that the conquest of Constantinople takes place after the Malhamah. The conquest of Constantinople will take place after the Malhamah. For those who still have the capacity to think and not all people can think anymore today. Has the Malhama taken place as yet? The Great War, Armageddon? No. Not from our perspective. Because the Malhama will take place when 99 out of every 100 will die in that war. And there's never been a war like that in history. There's never been a war like that in history when 99% of all combatants have died, have been killed. So the Malhama has not as yet taken place. It's difficult for Turkey and for the Balkans <coughs> to stomach that. But I can't help you, you have to help yourself. I am teaching you the truth. Others may have taught you other things. The Malhama has not as yet taken place. And so the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Nabi Muhammad has not as yet taken place. Whether you like it or whether you don't is irrelevant to us. This is the truth. This is not Hollywood. Well, why the conquest of Constantinople after the Malhama? Because we know that Allah is intervening in the Malhama. Because Allah says in Surah Al-Rahman, 
and I love it. Oh yes, I love it. Sanufragu lakum ayyu hasakalan. We're going to deal with you. You who are loaded with sin. We're going to deal with you. And then he tells us how he's going to deal with them. Yursalu alaykuma shuhazun min nar wa luhas falatan tasiran. I'm going to send against you a flash of fire which will be followed by smoke. And at that time, there will be none to help you. That looks like nuclear war to me. <laughs> so Allah is going to deal with them. And if Allah intervenes in the Malhama, it must be by Allah's design that the conquest of Constantinople will take place after the Malhama, not by accident. So why? Should Allah ordain that the conquest of Constantinople should take place after the Malhamah? Answer? <coughs> because our Christian allies, those who are following Nabi Isa alayhi salam, they need the Bosphorus to come to the Mediterranean. And these Christians control the Bosphorus. They control it through their ally, the Ottoman Empire. And then they control it through NATO and the secular state of Turkey, which is a member of NATO. But now, after the Malhama, goodbye to NATO. So the conquest of Constantinople can take place not with a Christian army, a Muslim army. The Christians must not make the mistake. Let me use this message to send a message to them. Don't make the mistake to send an army to conquer Constantinople. Because if you do that, the Jal will be very happy. He will unite the whole world of Islam against you. So leave it to us. We will liberate Constantinople. So the first implication of the liberation of Constantinople is that our Christian allies with whom we make an alliance will now be able, be able to pass through the Bosphorus to come into the Mediterranean. And that's bad news for Israel. But there's a second reason for the conquest of Constantinople. And that is that when we conquer Constantinople, yeah. when we conquer Constantinople, we return Hagia Sophia to the Christian world. And we'll offer an apology to the Christian world for what the Ottomans did, which was disgraceful, which was shameful, which was sinful, to take the house of Allah, which is a church, or a synagogue, or a temple. This is what Surah al Hajj said. That you take the temple or the church or the synagogue or the cathedral of the Christian people and you convert it into a masjid, you are committing a sin. You are violating Allah's command in the Quran. <coughs> so when the conquest of Constantinople takes place and we return Hagia Sophia <coughs> to the Orthodox Christian world, that will seal the alliance. But none can then break. We continue, inshallah, after Salatul Maghrib. Inshallah, we'll pause for Salatul Maghrib. Inshallah, we'll resume about 8 o'clock. And then, inshallah, about 8.45, there will be a Q&A session. Mm -hmm. And the questions will strictly be related to the subject. Our topic that we now resume is Alliance with Rome. And Rome is the Christian, Orthodox, Byzantine Empire, which today is led by Russia. And they are the ones who are following Nabi Isa. 
and Allah says that he's going to intervene to cause these Christians to become over powerful dominant over the others who are committing kufr and when that takes place then it will continue until Kiyama and I want to suggest to you that that moment <coughs> is about to occur when Allah will intervene to ensure that in the war which is now about to take place that this part of the Christian world which is faithful to Nabi Islam will overcome that part which is committing kufr and that this part will then remain dominant over that part until Qiyamah. Surah Al-Rahman confirms our conclusion. We have pointed out that in Surah Al-Rahman Allah has spoken about two people and he repeats the ayah 31 times. So he's making 31 attempts to get us to think. Why did he not mention it only once? Why? 31 times. <laughs> and who are these two? Rabb two two people who are they that he's addressing and who are rejecting the truth which has come from Allah rejecting the truth which has come from Allah to Kaziban and he answers Ya Ma'ashar al Jinni Walims it is an alliance of human beings who are sinful, rejecting the truth from Allah, and jinn, who are kuffar, who are shayateen. The signs <coughs> of these two. And he tells us how to recognize them. When he goes on to say, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins, in istata'atum, and tanfuzu min aqtari samawati wallah. If you wish to embark on the efforts to explore and to penetrate that which is above and that which is below, the oceans, the depths of the earth, then go ahead and make the effort. And we see who are the people who did it, who gave us the world, gave to the world all the Star Wars and the intercontinental ballistic missiles and the satellites and so on. And who then used their control of the air, the skies, to establish their military dominance over the world. It is these Christians there. Yeah. And they were able to do it because they were in alliance with the Shayateen. They won't teach you this at Oxford University. <laughs> but the truth doesn't come from Oxford. It comes from the Quran. And woe unto those who are neglectful of the Quran. Woe unto those who will not go to the Quran to seek to explain the reality which is right there in front of you today and which has been there with you for 500 years. But Allah goes on to say something more. He says, La tanfuduna illa bi sultan. Don't forget. Never forget for one moment that you'll only be able to get your missiles to fly and your revolving satellites and your military stations up there in the sky and your robotic submarines at the bottom of the ocean nuclear armed and stuff 
This will only take place to the extent that authority is given. And authority comes from Allah, not from the Security Council of the United Nations. <laughs> and so, inherent in this declaration is that that they should never have forgotten when they started NASA and they started their attempt to control the skies, military. Allah says, in the same way that Allah gave authority for you to do it, one day he can withhold that authority. On that day when he decides that this part of the Christian world is now going to become ascendant over that part of the Christian world, on that day he can withhold authority. I don't know if there are other scholars of Islam who are explaining Surah Rahman this way. I don't know. There may be. But I'm saying to you that the Quran is actually telling us that in the war which is now coming, the 500 years of Western dominance over mankind is coming to an end. And modern Western civilization is riding out into the sunset. And those who follow Nabi Isa alayhi salam, after this war which is coming, will now be dominant over their rivals. What remains to be done now is to show the implications of the conquest of Constantinople which will follow the Great War. And since Allah is intervening in the Great War, since Allah is intervening in the Great War to ensure that this side becomes dominant over that side, and when this happens, it will be Ilayahumil Kiyama. This side will be dominant over that side until the end of the world. It follows that Allah must also be the one who chose <coughs> that the conquest of Constantinople should follow the Great War. Where is Constantinople? Today they've changed the name to Istanbul. And they prohibited the use of the name Constantinople. Why? Because they don't want you to remember what Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was the Prophet said. That's why they did it. This is the Black Sea. And this is here, again, the Black Sea. And this is the Mediterranean Sea here. And this is the Bosphorus. If you, if you want to move from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, you have to pass through the Bosphorus. The Black Sea has Crimea, we can't see it on this map. Crimea controls the Black Sea. Here is Crimea, yeah, here is Crimea. If you control Crimea, you control the whole of the Black Sea. And that's what Russia just achieved two years ago. And when Russia took back Crimea, we said, it's time for us to celebrate. <laughs> Go back and see the, my lectures on YouTube. I said, this is a time for us to celebrate because Russia has recovered Crimea, which means Russia now controls the Black Sea. But if you control the Black Sea, you still need to pass through there to come to the Mediterranean Sea. And the conquest of Constantinople here is meant to liberate the Bosphorus so that the Russian Navy could pass through there. But I said there's another reason why Allah has chosen that the conquest of Constantinople must follow the Malhama. And that is because of Hagia Sophia. There we are. There is Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia. 
This is the Christian cathedral of the Orthodox Christian people. This is their major, more foremost cathedral in the world. And this has been the most important cathedral for them for 1,000 years. So it was not by accident, not at all, but by satanic design that the Sultan Muhammad Fatih, when he conquered Constantinople, the first thing that he did was to take this cathedral and convert it into a masjid. It was by satanic design. It was meant to sabotage the end time friendship and alliance between the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Ummah of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. That's why Sultan Muhammad Fatih disgracefully and shamefully and manifestly sinfully took this cathedral and converted it into a masjid to the eternal shame and disgrace of the world of Islam. And so now we know <laughs> that we, the reason why the conquest of Constantinople takes place after the Malhama is so that when we conquer Constantinople, we can then return this cathedral to the Orthodox Christian world. And the dagger which has been planted into their hearts will be withdrawn and the blood will stop flowing and the alliance with Rome will then be cemented. But there are those who say, how can you have an alliance with the people, how can you call them Christian, when they worship Jesus as God and they declare that he is the Son of God? And this is ship. And the Quran declares that Allah is prepared to forgive all sins but not shit. What answer do we have to give? The answer is do not take any verse of the Quran in isolation because you could be ending up misguided. You will end up declaring that Iblis was an angel. <laughs> which is what they believe, and that he committed this big sin, and then he became a fallen angel. That's what they believe. But we, don't, we don't believe that angels fall down. So be careful. Do not take any verse of the Quran in isolation. Otherwise, you can make the mistake of ending up believing that Iblis was an angel. Proper methodology is to go to all the verses of the Quran, not to one. Here is one verse which says that Allah will not forgive shirk. But look at the other one now. Surah Al-Ma'idah. And Allah speaks to Nabi Isa alayhi salam and asks him, Did you say to the people, to worship me and my mother as gods beside Allah, did you do that? And he said, no, I never did that. I never taught them anything other than what you taught me. Well, then he ends by saying, if you punish them for this belief that I am God and the Son of God, if you punish them, then they are your servants and you have the right to punish them. But if you forgive them, you doubt me that this is in the Quran? Do you doubt that? That? Yes, this is in the Quran. Go check it out. But if you forgive them, then you are the forgiving, the merciful, including therefore the possibility that the entire Christian world which worships Jesus as God and as the Son of God can be forgiven by Allah if He chooses to. So it's not for us to pass judgment. It's for Allah to pass judgment. And so don't say 
Well, how can we call them Ahlul Kitab when they eating pork? How can we call them Ahlul Kitab when they say that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate? How can we call them Ahlul Kitab when they're lending money on interest? How can we do this? How can we do this? How can we? And then endless, endless, endless objections. The answer is, if a man says, when the angel questions him, which is your prophet? And he says, Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam. And the man is drinking alcohol, as many Muslims are drinking today. He may be eating bacon and eggs for breakfast <laughs> and drinking wine for lunch. It's not for you to say he's not a Muslim. Only Allah can say that. Allah has said in the Quran, Whosoever from amongst you turn to them, meaning the alliance of Jews and Christians, which is today the Zionist alliance. If you turn to them with friendship and alliance, you no longer belong to us, you belong to them. Only Allah is authorized to say that. That this man is no longer a Muslim. If we come to that fatwa, it has to be based on the Quran. So you cannot say they are not Ahlul Kitab anymore. Unless Allah says so. <coughs> so be careful. Be careful when you speak like this. So it is possible that Allah can forgive them. But we know that once Nabi Isa Islam comes back, then something is going to happen to the entire world of Christians and Jews who are Ahlul Kitab. What does the Quran say? It says in Surah Al-Nisa, وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا That when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, then every single wrong belief that they had, every single thing that they rejected that was the truth, they would have to accept it. But for some of them, it will be too late. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا The door for mercy and for Tawbah is now closed for you. But for others, for others, they now recognize Nabi, Nabi Muhammad as a prophet. Yes. And they now recognize the Quran as the word of Allah. Yes. They do not enter into the Ummah because that's an obligatory because they have their Nabi, and they have their Sharia, and they have their Qibla, and their Qibla is still valid. That's what the Quran says. The Quran says their Qibla is still valid. The Quran says their Qibla is still valid for them. Go and check it out. Go and check it out. So where does nonsense has come from? That everybody will have to join the Ummah of Muhammad including Nabi Isa Islam. I'm sorry for you on Judgment Day. I'm sorry for you on Judgment Day if you open your mouth to utter such nonsense. Because Allah never sent him to this Ummah. If you don't study the Quran, then you speak nonsense. Allah sent him to Banu Israel, not to this Ummah. And you want him to take shahada and become a member of this ummah. I mean, this is a PhD in stupidity. And so now we can end to cement the alliance with just one more verse of the Quran. And I love this one. It shows the extremely close bond of love between that Nabi and this Nabi. In consequence of which, 
the alliance between this Ummah and this Ummah is inevitable. Shall we continue? Nabi Isha al-Islam addresses Banu Israel and informs them that he is the messenger of Allah unto them. And he has come to confirm the truth which was there before in the Torah. Musaddikan lima bayna yadayka min al-Torah. But then he goes on to say something else. وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ Did you hear that? I have come to give you the good news of a messenger. Rasul is a messenger. A Nabi who is sent to a people becomes a messenger. A Rasul. And his name will be Ahmad. Oh, but wait a minute. Did he not study the Quran? Yes, Allah taught him the Quran. Because Allah says so in the Quran. When the angel came to Maryam, السلام, the angel informed her that this baby boy who is going to be born will be Al-Masih, the Messiah. And that Allah is going to teach him. وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابِ And if you do only five rupees worth of it, research, you know kitab here is the Quran. Not much. Five rupees. وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْتَوْرَةِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ And Allah is going to teach him the Qur'an, the Kitab here is the Qur'an, and Allah is going to teach him the Torah and the Injil. But in between the, the Qur'an on this side and the Torah and the Injil on that side, why does Allah put the word Hikmah? Huh? You know when he comes down? Imam al-Mahdi would recognize him. This is the son of Mary. And then our Imam or our Khalifa, our Amir al-Mu'min in that time will do the right thing. Oh yes, he'll do the right thing. He will invite him to lead the Salah. This is Nabi Allah. <laughs> I am only Ibam. He is Nabi. So he does the right thing to invite him to lead the Salat. If Allah did not teach him the Quran and the Injil and the Zabur and the Torah and the Sharia on this side and the Sharia on that side, you can make a mistake and then all fall down. So he has to have hikmah to handle the situation. A sharia on this side, a sharia on that side. And there is the hikmah. Because he knows that if he accepts the invitation and he leaves the salah, he will be in conflict with Allah's guidance. He must know that. That once you leave the salat and the Imam prays behind you, you now become Amir al mukminin of this Ummah. But Allah send, did not send him to this Ummah. So he cannot leave the salat. Here is the hikmah. And that's why he says, the people have appointed you to leave the salat. You need the salah. But when he performs the salah behind Imam al-Mahdi, 
he must know how to perform salata. Otherwise, you can make a mistake. The first time he's taking performing salat this way, because their salat is different, and their salat is different, and our salat is different, different sharia. So Allah teaches him the sharia here and the sharia there. And because he has to stand between these two, you better have a lot of wisdom. So he says to Banu Israel, I've come to give you the good news of a Rasul, meaning a Nabi who is sent to a people that is a Rasul. Or someone who is sent by Allah to a people that's a Rasul. Someone could be a, an angel, sent an angel, become a Rasul. And his name would be Ahmad. But he knows the name is Muhammad. Because he studied the Quran. Allah taught him the Quran. And Allah has mentioned four times in the Quran the name is Muhammad. Muhammadur Rasulullah. Walladhina na'ahu ashidda'u ala al-kuffar ila akhid al وَمَا Muhammad illa Rasul. Four times in the Quran, four times, the name is mentioned as Muhammad. So why did he say Ahmad? <laughs> the Quran has come down. If all the explanations of the Quran are already given, do we have any need to think? Is there any need to think if every explanation is already given? So why should he say the Quran has been sent down because there is still more in the Quran for you to extract. If you think, but now we have stopped thinking. The Darul Ulum stopped thinking long ago. I'm not using these words to make people feel bad. No, that's not my style. I'm using these words because this is the truth. Iqbal, Iqbal said, we stopped thinking 500 years ago. That's what Iqbal said. We stopped thinking 500 years ago. My answer is that Allah is sending a powerful message with this one word. وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتٍ مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ Allah is saying to us, if we have the capacity to think, the Nabi Isa alayhi salam is choosing a secret name, a special name for only him and him between them. That when there's intense love between two people, you never address them by their name. That's love. No matter if you reach a hundred years of age, you're an old man with a walking stick. And she's an old woman with a walking stick. And you have a secret name for her. You will use that name until the end of the world. That's love. A special name, a secret name. And so when the Isa al-Islam returns to his world, every time he refers to our Nabi, he will say Ahmad. Why? Allah is saying, this is the bond of intense love that exists between this Nabi and that Nabi. And Nabi Muhammad al-Islam confirmed it. And he said, Mormon, he said that when he comes back, he will die. And he'll be buried next to me. 
And so now, let's think. If this Nabi, who is leading this Ummah, and this Nabi, who is leading this Ummah, have intense love and affection for each other, what should the relationship be between this Ummah and this Ummah? I rest my case. I rest my case. I rest my case. That the natural alliance for the Ummah of Muhammad is an alliance with the Ummah of Nabi Isa Islam. And it must be with those who are following him. And we know who are those who are following him. Because they don't, they don't declare that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might open our hearts to the Qur'an. That we might do our homework with the Qur'an. And search in the Qur'an for that which explains the reality of the world today. And when we find it, to proclaim it, regardless of the price we have to pay. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanja samir alim. Wa tub alayna ya mulana inna kanja tawab rahim. Wa rahmatika ya akhma rahim. Amin. Question and answer session. Inshallah, I think there's a, a brother and a sister who will be coordinating the questions from the sisters. So can the, if the sisters do have any questions, if you could please uh, write them down and pass them on to the nominated sister. And inshallah, we'll uh, get those questions raised with the Sheikh. Um, over to yourselves now. Uh, in, in regards to the subject that the Sheikh's been talking on, uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Any questions? Yeah. What is the current situation in Turkey? What, what's there? What's there now? Turkey. Turkey. What happened to Turkey? It's the name of our country, yes? Yeah. This question is what's, what's the current situation with Turkey and what's their role within the Malhama? What is our current situation with Turkey and what is their role in the Malhama? You cannot understand Turkey today without understanding the Ottoman Empire for 600 years. The Ottoman Empire was created by Dajjal, like Saudi Arabia was created by Dajjal. Like Pakistan had been ruled and controlled by Dajjal from day one. From day one. And every time Pakistan has attempted to get out of the crutches, they've killed the leader. Uh, so the Ottoman Empire has been <coughs> created by the Dajjal, but the Dajjal is not a fool. No, no, no. So the Ottoman Empire may, did many good things. Oh yes. But the Ottoman Empire waged endless wars, unjust wars, unjust bogus jihad on the Orthodox Christian world for 600 years. And the reason why they did that was to sabotage the end, end, end time alliance and friendship between this Ummah and this Ummah. The reason why the Ottoman Empire took Hagia Sophia and converted it into a masjid was to ensure that this alliance never comes into being between this Ummah and this Ummah. The reason why the Ottoman Empire took the name Constantinople and threw it away and replaced it with Istanbul and prohibited the use of the name Constantinople in Turkey is because they want to sabotage the end time friendship and alliance between this Ummah and this Ummah. But the Turkish people have been so brainwashed and brainwashed and brainwashed. The intensity of the brainwash is so great that they hate me now probably more than they hate anybody else on the face of the earth. That's my status today in Turkey and in the Balkans. But I don't care two peanuts at all. If what I am speaking is the truth, if I am explaining the Quran correctly, I am on the right side of history and you on the wrong side of history. So I have to continue my work and pray to Allah for protection. That's right. 
What is Turkey's role today and in the Han Malhana? Turkey is a member of NATO. Regardless of whatever statements they are making that are opposed to NATO, the fact is that they are legally, legally by treaty, a member of NATO. And they have a lawful legal obligation. If war takes place and the Western Alliance attacks Russia, then Turkey has a legal obligation to fight against Russia. The Russians know that. The Turkish people know that. How will Turkey behave? How will Turkey behave <laughs> if the war breaks out? My answer is I do not trust the Turkish ruler today. And my answer is I don't think Russia trusts him as well. I don't have anything more to say. Yeah. Uh, if, if, the, if, if the Ottoman Empire uh, is, uh, is created by the Jal, then uh, you know the contributions that the Ottoman Empire has made to Islam uh, in terms of literature and the restoration of the Prophet's mosque, uh, are they also from the Jal? Oh, I just answered that question. Perhaps you were not here. I just answered that question. I said the Jal is not a fool. <laughs> The Jal is not a fool, okay? The Jal will do many good things in order to slip the evil in. Saudi Arabia today is a country universally, rec universally recognized in the world of Islam. As garbage, those who rule over Saudi Arabia. As garbage, as people who have betrayed us. Betrayed the Ummah. And yet, you will find in Saudi Arabia aspects of Islam you will not find anywhere else in the world. Okay? Because Dajjal is not a fool. Any more? But Trumpa said, uh, Trumpa said that he's a, uh, the Saudi, the, the, he's, he recognizes... Someone will have to tell me what's the question and I, I can't hear. What's the, what's the question, so, brother? The question is, Trumpa said that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel as the last period of of the build up to the Madama started with this pronunciation of this. What uh, Trump has done, and of course you know he's a schoolboy, is to extend legal recognition, diplomatic recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, of US recognition. But in doing so, He's done us a favor. <laughs> because Jerusalem is the most important city in the world for every Jew. And Jerusalem is the most important city in the world for every Christian. And insofar as Islamic eschatology is concerned, the end time. Jerusalem stands at the heart of Akhiru Zaman for a Muslim. Numran Ubaitin Naqdis Karabu Yadjim. And so there are three claims to Jerusalem. The world of Islam, the world of Christianity, the world of Judaism. Masjid Al-Aqsa is in the Quran, not just in the hearts of Muslims, it's in the Quran. And so if the schoolboy in Washington had some common sense, as many in the American diplomatic service would agree, then the US, US government, instead of extending diplomatic recollection to only the Jews for Jerusalem, you control Jerusalem, Israel would rather have recognized the rights of all three religions and would have said that we have to work out a formula where all three faiths can share Jerusalem on the basis of <coughs> political equality and mutual respect. If he had used these words, if he had used these words that I just used, that we have to find a formula 
where all three faiths can share Jerusalem on the basis of political equality and mutual respect, Trump's name would have gone down in history in gold. What he has done, however, is to take Christianity and throw it out into the cold. Not that Christianity which is in alliance with Judaism, the other Christianity, which is not, where a man cannot marry another man and get a marriage together. And the world of Islam and taking them and throw them out into the cold. So in the process of giving Jerusalem to only the Jews, he has now ensured the alliance of Islam with this Christianity. Any more questions? I have a question from one of the sisters. Uh, the sister asks, Anbiya slash Rasul are buried at the place of their passing. The Hadith states, Isa alayhi salam will be buried in Medina. How do we re reconcile between the two? I would be grateful if you can kindly provide me from the Book of Allah the evidence that Anbiya are buried at the place where they die. I don't know that this is in the Quran. Okay? And I don't know where he will die. Do you know where he will die? Does anyone know where he is dying? The Quran does not tell us where he will die. The Hadith does not tell us where he will die, but we are told that he will be buried in Medina. And for me that's enough, I don't have any more questions to ask. It, the uh, the Turkey, Turkey breaks away from the NATO. Is there a chance that Turkey falling into the alliance of the world? Which appears to be. If Turkey breaks its connection with NATO, revokes its membership in NATO. Is it possible that Turkey can then enter into an alliance with Rome? That's the question. My answer is I would be the most surprised man on the face of the earth if Turkey en 